Praise be Jesus and Mary. Today's gospel, our Lord speaks of persecution. The immediate context of his words is the coming persecution of the apostles in the early church after his resurrection. Everything that our Lord predicts, being delivered up to councils, flogged in synagogues, dragged before governors and kings, and being put to death by people of one's own household. These are all things that we read about in the book of Acts that happen between the time of Pentecost and the destruction of Jerusalem. That's how some commentators have interpreted the last words of Jesus in today's gospel when he says, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. He says in Matthew 10, 23, that's interpreted as Christ's visitation of destruction upon unfaithful Jerusalem by the hands of the Romans in 70 AD. Jesus said to the apostles, he said, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and simple as doves. Matthew 10, 16. We've commented on this verse before. I don't remember exactly when we did, but one thing we want to note here is that goodness is not violent. Evil is. Sheep are not violent. Wolves are violent. In addition to violence, evil is also proud and hostile and aggressive. Good is humble, meek, and gentle. The evil are righteous in their own eyes. The good, well, they're righteous in God's eyes. It's a big difference. Uh, and the good have the Holy Spirit to defend them, as our Lord says in verse 20, whereas the evil or those who do evil do not have the Holy Spirit. The good at times can also display some of the defects of their adversaries, but those aren't their predominant dispositions. You know, the vast majority of Christ's disciples will only be fully purified in the next life, so down here we should expect some difficulties or some defects here and there. But those defects aren't predominant dispositions for God's children. Our Lord says in today's gospel that on a human level, the main defense of the good, the main defense of the sheep, are the main human defense is innocence and, pure, and prudence. We know that self-defense is and always will be a legitimate principle, and the church upholds that principle, so it's against pacifism. But nonetheless, violent confrontation should be a last recourse, especially when it comes to testifying to the truth of the gospel. We don't testify to Christ through violence. Part of what our Lord is sharing with his, his apostles in today's gospels and with us by extension is that we should be realistic. We need to be realistic about what to expect if we're going to be true disciples of Christ. We need to be realistic in what we expect and Christ-like in how we respond. As Catholics living in an anti-Christian culture, if we aren't experiencing any opposition or any pushback or any hostility or any persecutions or ostracizing for our beliefs, and we need to stop and ask ourselves sometimes if we really are witnessing to Christ. And one of the main problems in the church today is that often instead of being salt and light to the unbelieving culture, to the pagan culture, instead of being salt and light, we, we're often just too much like them. We just too much, we resemble them too much. We know we're called to be witnesses to the culture. We're not called to be wedded to the culture. Two different things. Christ is the bridegroom of the church. The Western secular culture isn't our bride or our bridegroom, for that matter. We can't be married, as it were, to both of them. You know, we can't be faithful to Christ and, and to the anti-Christian culture. At the same time, Catholics are called to be non-conformists, as St. Paul said in Romans 12, too. He said, do not conform. Do not conform yourselves to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you may know what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect, says the apostle. We're called to be what Christ was and still is, a sign of contradiction to the non-believing world. When the prophet Simeon took our Lord in his arms as a baby, he called Jesus, quote, a sign that we be, would be spoken against or contradicted. That's Luke 2. 
34. In Latin, it's cui contradicetur, uh, to be contradicted. And the book of Acts itself, which is where the persecution really starts rearing, it, rearing its ugly head there, the book of Acts actually closes with the Jewish leaders in Rome saying to St. Paul, quote, with regard to this sect, meaning those who follow Christ, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Acts 28, verse 22, also translated as everywhere it is denounced or contradicted. A contradicitor in the Latin Vulgate. So if Christ was a sign of contradiction, we too will be a sign of contradiction. We will contradict the prevailing secular, agnostic, atheistic, spiritualistic even mindset and culture. But notice that our Lord says that we won't be persecuted just by the unbelieving culture. He says that we'll also experience domestic persecution. He said, brother will deliver up brother to death and the father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. He said in Matthew 10, 21. So in your homes, in your communities, even in the church at times, if you're striving to be faithful to Christ and grow in holiness, expect persecution. And don't expect to be able to escape it either. Uh, our Lord said that even those who leave everything for his sake will receive persecution. He said that, for example, in Mark 10, verse 30. So we should ask ourselves, why should I expect or hope to escape something that Jesus promises he's going to give me? He promises I'm going to get persecution. Why should I expect to escape that? Uh, yes, life in the world is difficult, but even if we were abandoned all, the wor all that, abandon the world and go off to the monastery, expect difficulties and persecutions there. St. Benedict, whose feast we would celebrate in two days if it wasn't Sunday this year, the brothers of St. Benedict tried to poison him a few times. Okay, there's actually, I remember when I was in Italy, seeing, uh, going to one of the Benedictine monasteries, and seeing the fresco on the wall of the brothers actually poisoning his food and wine. Uh, they actually painted that on the wall. Uh, St. Pio, we know, was persecuted as well. I remember reading recently St. Charbel was mistreated even in his monastery. Uh, so the grass isn't greener on the other side. No matter where we are, we should expect that in some form or, fa fa or fashion, we're going to experience some persecution and mistreatment. If we're misbehaving in some way, then of course we deserve that, right? Uh, but if our aim is to be faithful to Christ, if our aim is to be like him, we're going to be treated as he was treated. He came to his own, and his own people received him not, said St. John in the, pro in the prologue of his gospel, John 1, 11. So if we think of persecution as purification, if we think of it as the purification of our soul, then it can be more bearable for us at times. In truth, and this is something that we don't often focus on, but in truth, our persecutors are actually our greatest benefactors. Believe it or not, they don't know that, but they really are. Uh, our Lord said, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He says in Matthew 5, 11 and 12. So it's through our persecutors that actually our greatest rewards come. So if they knew that, they might actually leave us alone, right? So it's better not to tell them. We will keep that a secret for now. We won't let them know that they're our greatest benefactors. Uh, I remember reading, uh, I think it was St. Teresa of Avila. She, uh, she had a special love for those who persecuted her, a special place in her heart for them. Why was that? Well, because she understood this principle. She saw life from God's point of view. She, she took to heart our Lord's teachings that her persecutors we're the ones who are bringing her closest to our Lord. So if we begin to see persecution in that light, in the light of Christ, then maybe it'll be easier for us to accept contradiction and suffering at the hands of others. We know God always wins, and so if we stay on his side, then we'll always be on the winning side, no matter what happens to us or, or what happens around us. So today, let's ask Our Lady for the grace to be witnesses to the truth, to be witnesses to her son, 
but to do it in the way that our Lord wants us to do it, not like wolves, but like sheep. And let's remember the admonition of St. Peter when he tells us to, quote, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, says the apostle, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. 1 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16. Praise be Jesus and Mary.